Next up, we have Jeremy Gardner presenting on using the blockchain to predict the future. course of human history, beyond sex, food, sleep, and, well, survival, humans have had a few innate desires. You can find this in almost virtually every civilization. One of those desires is to bet. When an individual thinks they're right, they like to bet another that believes they're wrong. Another desire is to predict the future. What Augur does it takes the former desire to help enable the latter. But before we get there, I want to talk about prediction making. Who should we trust when making predictions? Historically, we've had fortune tellers, tarot card readers, oracles. The ancient Chinese had something called oracle bones, which is some of the earliest dated writing. And, uh, prophet like figures would uh, divine the future and write on these turtle shells. Now, none of these mechanisms were particularly accurate. Um, in conte contemporary society, we have pundits. We've got individuals like Bill O'Reilly and Paul Krugman, who, to give them credit, are often right, um, but they're often not. Um, and this has proven to be a problem when we rely too much on punditry and don't choose to look at our own opinions. So then there's opinion polls. Now, opinion polls are good, and some of you may not be able to see this, but this is from a late October 2012, in the midst of the general election uh, between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. You know, some of these polls were right. O Obama was due to win. Uh, but most of them said actually he was not going to. And the ones that did only gave him a few percentage points ahead of Romney. Um, now, this is somewhat concerning because a lot of people believed that it was pretty clear that Barack Obama was going to win. And, and, and this kind of reverts to the notion of the wisdom of crowds. Now, opinion polls somewhere get at, somewhat get at. Uh, the wisdom of crowds. Um, if you're not familiar with the concept, I'll run through a couple of examples. Um, a few years ago, a uh, Columbia Business School professor asked his 71 students how many jelly beans were in a jar of candy. And they guessed anywhere from 250 to 4,100 jelly beans. Now, they guessed on average um, that there, well, the average rate of error was 62%. Um, the actual number of candies was, was 1,116. Um, only two students did better than that average rate of error. However, if you took the average of all these people's guesses, what you got was 1,151, which was only 3% off from the correct number of jelly beans. Now, if these people have been betting money or that there have been more of them, you can begin to imagine that they would have been more accurate. This test has been replicated multiple times. To the right, you see Jeopardy, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Trivia game show. When someone gets stumped on a question, they get three lifelines. First is 50-50, cancel out half the questions. Not important in this scenario. So then the two others are phone a friend. Phone a friend enables you to call on an expert uh, that you know that you think will believe will have the right answer to the question you're stumped on. The other is pull the audience. Now you think, and most contestants do, that when they call the expert, the expert is going to be right. Turns out, the expert's only right 65% of the time. Not bad. Um, but when the contestant pulls the audience, the audience is right 91% of the time. Now. Your average game show audience is not a bunch of Harvard PhDs, but the fact of the matter is, is that when you aggregate their knowledge, 
you can derive that truth or get closer to it. And that is the premise of a prediction market. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, a prediction market is a market quite similar to a stock market where you can buy and sell shares. But instead of buying and selling shares in the future price of a company, you can buy and sell shares in the future outcome of an event. Sports, weather, you can do stocks if you'd like. Um, and you can buy and sell yes or no shares, depending on whether you think the event will happen. Right here, you have the 2012 election. So instead of yes or no shares, you have Barack or Romney shares. But it's the same general premise. Um, the price per share can only be between, on this market, which was uh, hosted by Intrade, a popular prediction market, um, the price per share could only be between a penny and $10. Now, depending on how many Barack Obama shares were being bought, that would affect the price of Mitt Romney shares because it's the same yes or no premise. So, if more people believe Barack Obama would be elected and thus more Barack Obama shares were purchased, let's say the price per share was $5.85 out of $10. Correspondingly, the price for Mitt Romney shares were $4.15 a share. Now, what you can do in a market with liquidity and volume is take that price per share and understand it as a probability the crowd has assigned of the event occurring. Now, you may think this is crazy, you know, you're just buying and selling shares. But if you look right here, which is October 21st, Barack Obama is at just about 60% probability of winning, whereas Mitt Romney is at probably 40% chance of winning. Now let's go back to those polls. I mean, this has been repeated multiple times. It was just most recently repeated in the UK parliamentary elections. Um, opinion polls had the Conservative and Labour Party neck and neck. The prediction markets that exist in the UK, one of the few countries where it's legal, had um, oh, the Conservatives far ahead. Turned out the Conservatives were far ahead. Um, you know, you had the head of one of the major polling companies resign. I mean, it's a disaster because what a prediction market does is that it doesn't just have people bet. It, it's a collection of all wisdom in humanity, pretty much. Literally, there's no resource you can't draw on to get the correct answer, make the right bet in a prediction market, which makes it more powerful than any individual tool in its own, on its own. Better than any AI, better than any machine learning that exists today. However, this being uh, in trade, which was quite popular, as I said, um, this is in trade now. Um, in trade, you don't need to read the text. In trade was shut down uh, by the CFTC due to violating some commodities laws, and it had some internal insolvency around the time its CEO fell off Mount Everest. So. <laughs> So you think, hey, well, Intrade didn't work out, but could another prediction market work? Well, like I said, there are some in the UK, but that's a small island nation, and most of the world can't actually access those prediction markets. As online betting, as prediction markets are often categorized, is illegal in 95% of countries. Um, so you have these massive regulatory hurdles. But that isn't to say others haven't tried. In fact, the CIA, DARPA, and the Department of Defense tried to build their own public policy prediction market in 2006. But when Congress caught wind of it, uh, their kind of puritanical views kicked in, and they saw it as a terrorist incentivization market uh, instead of kind of a flagging mechanism that it would have actually served as. Um, in 2010, the Hollywood Stock Exchange, which was a play money prediction market, for predicting the future uh, Fox Atmos returns of movies, actually received a no action letter from the CFTC that said they could run a real money prediction market. Of course, Hollywood threw their ar arms and were like, hold up, we don't want you predicting the, the box office returns of movies we know are gonna bomb, because in the first week, that's when we make all of our money, and we don't let reviewers <coughs> review it until the movie comes out. So if you have people betting that a film's gonna be a bomb before it's released, then people may not go see the movie. So Hollywood calls up its lobbyists, the Dodd-Frank Act, which was enacted after the major financial crisis. Um, they called up their legislators from California and said, hey, just throw in a little stipulation about prediction markets 
banning, wood, banning a Hollywood prediction markets, and other things that might nuisance us. <clears throat> sure enough, they did it. Dodd-Frank was a big act, and uh, sure enough, it was passed. So not all lost, uh, hope was lost yet uh, until Nadex, um, a derivatives exchange, tried to host a political prediction market for the 2012 elections. They got shut down. Um, they couldn't get the no action letter, despite us knowing from the results of those polls versus prediction markets, the prediction markets are a really great forecasting tool. So, the reason why I'm here today is to present you with an alternative, or better, a solution. The solution is Augur, and instead of telling you about Augur, I'm just going to show you it. So we're going to exit the slideshow real quick. And we're actually going to go to this platform because we've got working out the software right now. Um, this is Augur. It is a decentralized prediction market platform. It uses the blockchain um, in order to create a robust global software that allows anyone to make predictions. Let's see if we can make this any more visible. Uh, it doesn't really matter because our alpha testers are not the best forecasters, so the odds on almost all these markets are totally skewed. But what you have here is a platform that anyone can download or potentially access through a WebSocket and participate and create markets, assuming they have access to cryptocurrencies, which pretty much increases with every passing day. Um, you can go to a market such as Apes Will Rule the Planet by the fourth quarter 2019. Um, I'm actually kind of bullish on that, so, so I can go and I can buy some yes shares and I can buy like a hundred shares and I can move it up to 40% because you know it's not a very liquid market. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and then you can also create markets. All you need is your cryptocurrency of choice that works in our system. Hopefully sidechains will make virtually all cryptocurrencies compatible. And um, our primary cryptocurrency will be a stable currency that uh, maintains par with the US dollar just so there's no compounded risk in making uh, predictions because you know you don't want to make a prediction two years out and have the price of the currency you're using have a greater impact on your winnings than the actual event itself. But you can go and you can submit a market. You can say, all right, give me a second. I'm loud enough to not use this. Um, you can say, well, the price of Bitcoin be above $500 USD by New Year's. Um, yes, of course, of course. Uh, and, then, and then you set your trading fee. You can send it, set it to any uh, amount that you want. We can set, set it to 5% of which you will receive half of all the trading fees on that market that you're creating. So every time someone bets, 5% of their bet, because that's the odds that I set, you receive half of that. The, then you set the initial liquidity to incentivize people to use your market, because keep in mind, anybody else can also create the same market. So you want to set your trading fees low, liquidity high, to incentivize people to use your market. And of course, word it well. Um, you click next, and then we'd go to January 1st, uh, and then you let that baby rock. You just press submit. Not going to do it right now, because I probably spelled something wrong. But, uh, but it, it's the same general notion. Um, this is incredibly powerful. Um, you know, you, you have a platform that says intuitive to use as Amazon.com, but it allows you to create a global prediction engine. You can look at your, all the markets that you hold shares in, all the markets that you've authored, you can promote them to friends, and you can use it as a way to derive truth in any situation. Um, there are many examples of how a prediction market exactly can be used to benefit society. I created a couple markets, let's see if we can get this to work right now, that, uh, that are good examples of how this would work well. But what you can do is, we've spoken to major insurance companies, and all of a sudden you can create decentralized insurance markets. So I can create a market, let's see if we can get this to go, yes. So I can create a market that says in 2016, uh, there will be over 600 millimeters of accumulated rainfall in Argentina's Salta province. Now, this seems totally arbitrary and strange. But in Argentina, they don't have crop insurance. 
So what that means is when a farmer has a bad crop cycle or there isn't enough rain one year and all of his crops die, he shit out of luck. Now what I'm doing is creating a market that he can go on his computer, most people even in the developing world have computers these days or smartphones, can go online and I, I set the odds at 100%. So had set a high amount of liquidity. And now he can hedge against his crops now by buying no shares. Of, of, of course he wants to buy, of, of course he wants that rain to occur, but should it not, he now has a hedge against his crops. The money is there, and should, should there not be five, 600 millimeters at the end of the year, he now gets some of the money back that he would have never had because he doesn't have insurance. You can apply this to all sorts of scenarios. You know, a, a venture capitalist can go and he can say, Augur's for profit will raise at least $3 million in its seed round. We're a nonprofit right now. Uh, but what he can do is see what the crowd thinks. He can draw on the crowd's wisdom. And if the crowd believes that Augur's uh, for profit deserves at least $3 million in its seed round, more people buy yes shares, nobody's bought any shares yet. So, but, but, but more people buy yes shares, then he should finance the round because obviously the crowd thinks it's a good idea and it's a way to kind of draw on that accumulated knowledge. Thus, when he funds them, the crowd is rewarded for making that bet. If they don't make that bet, those who bet no are rewarded as well and the VC's out of a little bit of money. But it's a win-win situation. Um, I can't really emphasize enough the limitless applications of the software. Um, every time I give a talk, it, it, the, the applications people come up with kind of blow my mind. Um, but before we go any further, I want to explain how we keep the system totally uh, decentralized. Because in order to have a decentralized system, there can't be a central point of failure. Typically, in a prediction market, you'd have a single individual or a company that says whether or not event, an event happened. Of course, if that's the case, you end up like in trade. We don't want to fall off Mount Everest. So, instead, you create a system that allows not just a single individual or a single API, such as ESPNs, to say what happened, but a system that allows thousands of people to say what happened. And that's through a system called Reputation. Reputation is a cryptographic token. It's somewhat similar to Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. But what its function is, is, is as a sort of score. It's a score that's attached to a user's address. Now, the vast majority of users will not have um, Reputation. Those that do will buy it in a crowd sale that um, will occur in the next couple of months, one, about two weeks after Ethereum's Frontier launches. And it, it, it consists of 11 million tokens that will ever be created, all released at the end of this crowd sale. And Reputation allows its holders, every eight weeks, to report on the outcome of events. Was Hillary Clinton elected president? Did the Patriots win the Super Bowl? And you write, and you click yes, no, or there's an answer 0.5, which is ambiguous, indeterminate, you know, people write a bad question, or unethical question that incentivizes malicious behavior. And, and those three answers allow you to maintain a fully decentralized system, at which point there is no single point of failure. Now, when people are honest, and they report every eight weeks, they receive more reputation. Uh, and they receive the other half of the trading fees in the system that were uh, garnered from the trading fees created by the market maker earlier on. Now, however, if you try to lie, collude, manipulate in the system, or just forget to report on the outcome, you lose your reputation and it's redistributed to the good guys. It's the most meritocratic system that exists in the kind of cryptocurrency space today. Now, as I've repeatedly said, the applications for this technology are endless. I've kind of just composed a, a sh very short list of the various applications that individuals have kind of suggested to me. Um, some seem more outlandish than others, but you know, it's all tenable when you create a system that's so as intuitive as this. It's a very simple yet robust platform. We really couldn't be more excited about it but I know you guys have 
a bunch of questions. So thank you so much for your time. Questions? Yes. So I, I So the question was could you create a market about the Greek crisis, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so I I am fairly sure we have one. Um yeah, well well so the question is will inflation in Greece soar above 20%? It seems the market broke, but yeah, you can create a market about anything and it can be for as short a time period as you want or as long a time period as you want. Although, there's definitely a sweet spot that will be found over time, you know. Once this system actually goes live, right now we have an alpha that anybody can um, visit by going to augur.net. But once we go live, we'll start to see how these market dynamics truly work. But uh, a six-day market seems totally tenable to me. Yeah, but uh, earlier you said you could uh, predict so what, so what you get is when, peop, when thousands of people are buying and selling shares of yes or no, Greece will default on its debt. What you get is a probability because the price per share in our system is between less than a penny and a dollar. So let's say more, more people buy yes shares of Greece defaulting. So it costs like 57 cents for those shares and 43 cents for no shares. You can take that 57 cents per share and understand it as a probability of Greek defaulting, Greece defaulting. Now, of course, there's going to be fluke events, but what we're at, uh, predicting, pretty much, is that when you take the wisdom of crowds, more often than not, they're going to be going to be correct in predicting the future outcome of events. Yeah, but in your earlier slides, you could uh, search for the uh, prediction where you type something. You type something about something. Can you type right. back to that? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, anybody can create a market. Any, yeah. Anybody can create a prediction that anybody can participate in. Can you do it now? Yeah. Um, Greece will exit the euro 100%. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. do, do we have that? Oh, yeah. Well, Greece exit the euro. We actually already have that market right here. Do you believe yes or no? Yeah, so right now we're obviously in our alpha testing stage, so there, there's a limited number of, of volume. Yes, please. Um, how do you determine the honesty of the individuals with the initial reputation built? So we use something called K-clustering. Now, I sh shouldn't be answering that. If you have a question, Joey over there with the glasses and the blue polo can actually d explain the algorithms used to like kind of determine the liars. We actually have a great new blog post about creating a decentralized lie detector. So I really encourage you to go to augur.net, just check out our blog, it's our most recent blog post. And it explains in detail, several pages, how, how exactly we point out the liars. Um, I'm just not gonna do that right now. Can you explain really quickly in the context of uh, reputation, what happens uh, in the case of like, disputes about the input data that the conclusion, the conclusive data, which is to say, like in the rainfall example, if two different, if two different uh, um, you know, uh, agencies recorded different rainfalls and one was on the either side of the fence, right, it wouldn't necessarily be the original market maker's reputation at stake, but it would be it would be it would be the it would be the money. So so first of all, um, most of these markets are going to auto resolve themselves. In in that when someone buys and sells a share, they're most likely not going to wait for the reputation holders to report on the outcomes because that takes a little. Bit. More likely, when the event resolves, they're actually going to begin to sell right then because, because then they can get their money back. They sure they have to pay an additional trading fee, but it becomes it becomes more intuitive. And that then you avo avoid those sort of disputes. But I think as this system evolves, um, a lot of um, the participants 
are going to realize that if you want to create a market that people use, you have to be incredibly explicit in the questions and predictions that you make, or else there leaves those sorts of ambiguities that I didn't even consider. But yeah, that's a clearly a problem. And, and that's kind of the nature of decentralized systems. Early on, there's going to be some confusion. But as, as people get used to the system, they're going to know how to word questions better. Is there a reputation market for outcome data sources? What's that? There are like, can you use reputation for out, so output data sources? So like, if there's a dispute between two agencies, the market decides that one is more trustworthy than the other. Just to say. So yes, so you could, you so could say. So the market might hear about oh, Joey, I, I don't um, believe. This is not gambling. question I, I assume someone would ask this. Um, there, there, there are a few facets. Oh. Am I going to jail for building something like this? Um, more, more or less. Um, so there are a few facets to this answer. First of all, we are not a for-profit corporation. We're an open source, uh, non-profit foundation. Uh, kind of like Lin the Linux Foundation. Uh, kind of dedicated to improving this software. Um, that foundation, of course, is only kind of maintaining this code once it's released. It's not deriving any sort of profit. Um, there was an important case in the 90s called Junger versus Daily, which determined that open source software code, or actually all software code, constitutes free speech, as long as you're not deriving uh, profit from malice, which we clearly fall under that protection. So as long as we're writing the code, and that's it, and maintaining the code, we're protected under free speech. Um, secondly, this is a totally decentralized application, so we have no control or ownership over this software. Uh, we can't stop markets that are created or not, nor do we uh, profit from the markets that are created directly. So that's important. We've spoken to several regulatory agencies. At the end of the day, none of these regulatory agencies have guidelines towards decentralized applications. Um, you know, it's a whole new beast. But the way you can think of this most simply is uh, like BitTorrent. BitTorrent is a software service provider. It's literally just a platform upon which you can upload and download torrents. They don't control which torrents you upload or download. It's like Napster. Well, Napster was centralized and they did control that. And, and that's the difference. It's so, it's so, so you can think of you can think of Intrade as like Napster, and we're like BitTorrent. Whereas, whereas we don't control the content, but therefore we're not legally uh, responsible for the sorts of markets that are created. I can give you a much longer-winded explanation um, afterwards. I've already done it once today, so uh, I'm on the grind. All right, thank you so much, you guys.